Hello, I'm Dr. Hope Brugge from the University of California, San Francisco's Comprehensive Cancer Center. It's a great pleasure to be here today with you, albeit virtually, to talk about sequencing endocrine tre treatment in metastatic luminal breast cancer solving the puzzle. It's important for us to understand the differential subgroups that we're treating in the early versus advanced breast cancer setting. You've heard about intrinsic subtypes in earlier discussions today, uh, particularly from Dr. Pratt. I think what's interesting here is to actually look at the portion of patients from early stage disease to metastatic disease who have non-luminal intrinsic subtypes. And you can see that this number expands. And we know that non-luminal non hormone receptor positive disease has been associated with endocrine resistance and poor outcome. We also see here the intrinsic subtypes from Paloma 2 and Paloma 3, and you've seen responsiveness from intrinsic subtype data from Dr. Pratt in a large data set earlier today. However, what I think is most interesting here is when you look at the patients who have bone only to visceral disease, you see a reduction in the number of patients who have luminal A, the most endocrine sensitive disease, both in the first line and in the second or greater line setting shown here. There's an increase relatively in luminal B disease, but most markedly an increase in non-luminal disease, particularly in the second line setting and in visceral disease. This suggests that as patients progress uh, with cancer from the uh, first and second or greater line setting, when they receive prior chemotherapy, which a third of patients did in Paloma 3, and when they develop visceral disease, that they have a predominance of the relatively endocrine resistant subtypes of disease. So that leads us to the use of targeted agents in the treatment of patients with hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. As you know, there are three approved CDK4-6 inhibitors, palbociclib, ribociclib, and abemociclib. And this uh, approval was based on a number of different randomized phase three trials, which all showed an improvement in progression-free survival. In the first line setting, uh, a, the Mona Lisa 7 trial is the only trial which only enrolled first line patients to show an improvement in overall survival. This trial focused on patients who are pre or perimenopausal and could have received one prior chemotherapy, although only 14% of patients did. In these patients, progression-free survival was similarly increased with hazard ratios very similar to the trials that focused on postmenopausal patients. Uh, but these patients who had more luminal B disease and more de novo metastatic disease with a shorter disease-free interval had an overall survival benefit at a pre-planned interim analysis, really remarkable data, and suggesting that these agents really change the natural history of a hormone receptor positive disease. Subset analyses, which I don't have time to show you today, have shown that these agents are particularly beneficial in patients who have visceral disease, but are also beneficial in patients with bone-only disease. So clearly CDK4-6 inhibitors help not only our patients who have endocrine-sensitive disease, but in addition, the patients who have relatively endocrine-resistant disease as well. This is the updated overall survival data from Mona Lisa 7 presented by Debu Tripathi in a poster spotlight session at San Antonio this year. Because at the interim analysis that resulted in the overall survival uh, benefit in Mona Lisa 7 being presented and published, uh, the patients who had received ribociclib had not yet reached a median overall survival. This is considered a uh, ad hoc analysis. You can see here that the improvement in overall survival goes from 48 months with placebo to 58.7 months with ribociclib, more than a 10 month uh, difference. In addition, if you look at the time to chemotherapy and chemotherapy free survival, there is really a remarkable differences between placebo and ribociclib. This suggests not only that these agents are beneficial in the patients with the most endocrine resistant disease, younger women with hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer, but also that uh, these agents can delay the time to chemotherapy and chemotherapy-free survival in a group of patients who had visceral disease as well as de novo metastatic disease. This is a group of patients who often have received chemotherapy upfront in the past, but it's clear that we aren't benefiting patients by giving chemotherapy first. And it teaches us something important about sequencing endocrine therapy and targeted agents in patients with hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer.
Of course, we know also that we've seen benefit of CDK4-6 inhibitors in combination with fulvestrant in the second or greater line setting, as well as in with fulvestrant in the first and second line setting in the combined Mona Lisa 3 trial. And I've broken it down in terms of PFS in the first and second line setting. Paloma 3 was the only trial that allowed prior chemotherapy and about a third of the patients had received prior chemotherapy for metastatic disease. This impacted the progression-free survival in the control population with a PFS in the control population being only 4.6 months compared to over nine months in the trials that did not allow prior chemotherapy, both Monarch 2 and Mona Lisa 3. In addition, we've seen survival benefit in a number of these trials. Paloma 3, I'll talk about a little bit more, but in Monarch 2 and Mona Lisa 3, where the patients had more endocrine sensitive disease and had not received prior chemotherapy, there is a clear survival benefit. The Mona Lisa 3 trial combined both populations and then showed separately a, a numerical improvement in overall survival in the second line patients. This shows you the overall survival data from Mona Lisa 3 combining the first and second line groups uh, with a p-value of 0 0.00455 and a hazard ratio of 0.72. In Monarch 2, the overall survival benefit was 9.4 months with a very uh, statistically significant p-value and a similar hazard ratio to Mona Lisa 3 of 0.757. Because the median overall survival was not reached because of the inclusion of the uh, first line population uh, in Mona Lisa 3, a landmark analysis was performed at 36 and 42 months. And this shows you the percentage of patients surviving at both time points. Now, what we've learned actually, as I showed you earlier, is that progression-free survival in the control population varies depending on extent of prior treatment. In patients who'd received more prior treatment, the control population uh, had a shorter progression-free survival, although the hazard ratio for benefit from adding the CDK4-6 inhibitor was almost identical between the three different trials. The same is true for overall survival. This shows you the overall survival from Paloma 3, which although it showed a p-value, a one-sided p-value of 0.0246, uh, it actually needed to have by pre-specified significant threshold, a p-value of 0.0235, which it didn't reach. You can see that the median overall survival was 28 months in the placebo arm and 35 months in the uh, palbociclib arm. There was an initial assessment looking at the 80% of patients who had sensitivity to endocrine therapy versus not, suggesting that this might have identified a group of patients who are more likely uh, to respond to uh, palbociclib with an improvement in overall survival. However, we did a subsequent analysis with data presented at EBCC last fall and looked at the patients who'd received prior chemotherapy or not, since we know that prior chemotherapy increases the number of patients who have endocrine resistant disease and non-luminal intrinsic subtypes. Here you can see the 66% of patients in the intent to treat population who had not received prior chemotherapy with an absolute difference in median overall survival of 10.2 months and a hazard ratio very similar to the other trials at 0.75. With prior chemotherapy, no benefit was seen in the 34% of patients. So quite intriguing data and again suggests that we should not be giving chemotherapy to our patients with hormone receptor positive disease until we don't have any other options. Another question has come up when we're thinking about sequencing patients with hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer, not just with targeted agents, but also what the best chemo uh, endocrine partner is. Uh, we know from earlier data looking at patients who had endocrine uh, naive uh, disease in the metastatic set, first line metastatic setting that fulvestrant appeared to be superior to an aromatase inhibitor when you looked at patients who had uh, bone and soft tissue dominant disease. However, the progression-free survival was still much shorter than what we're used to seeing now with CDK4-6 inhibitors. The Parsifal trial is the first trial to try and look at this difference when you combine the endocrine partner with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. This data presented at ASCO last year showed that the median progression-free survival was similar regardless of whether patients who had relapsed at least a year from their adjuvant endocrine therapy or who had de novo metastatic disease received letrozole or fulvestrant in combination with palbociclib.
The trial was initially designed as a superiority uh, trial. However, this was clearly uh, not going to be an endpoint for this trial. If superiority was not achieved, the design was changed to a non-inferiority analysis with a non-inferiority margin of 1.21. That margin was not reached as well. As you can see here, uh, it was 1.45 as the upper margin. So although these curves uh, lie on top of each other, it doesn't statistically meet criteria for non-inferiority, but it's clearly not superior. So I think that this gives us a lot of confidence that we can choose the endocrine partner for a patient who's relapsed more than a year since their adjuvant aromatase inhibitor therapy or who hasn't had a prior AI, we can choose the endocrine partner based on the patient's individual situation. I would generally choose an aromatase inhibitor first because using fulvestrant in the second or greater line setting allows us more opportunities to target with, to partner with other targeted agents. Now, toxicities are different between the CDK4-6 inhibitors, as is the dosing schedule. Abamaciclib, which is given continuously, has more diarrhea, some liver enzyme abnormalities, and a slight increase in venous thromboembolic events. In contrast, palbociclib and ribociclib have more neutropenia, are given three weeks on, one week off, and then ribociclib uh, has a, a slight increased risk of QTC prolongation, particularly in patients who have pre-existing cardiac conditions with prolonged QTC or are taking medications like tamoxifen that might prolong the underlying QTC interval. There is a slight increase in uh, liver enzyme abnormalities that improve with a dose reduction and holding the dose. All of these drugs are associated with a, a small risk of uh, significant hair loss. Interestingly, abemaciclib also has an interference with the test for creatinine and uh, has a, almost all patients have an elevated creatinine without an alteration in renal function. One of the questions that's come up because of the remarkable efficacy and tolerability of CDK4-6 inhibitors is whether or not we could use them sequentially, much like we use trastezumab. A four-institution collaboration reported on 58 patients treated with abemaciclib after ribociclib or palbociclib. Some were sequential, some not. And you can see that about 47% had clinical benefit with a progression-free survival of about five months. Now, we don't know whether or not this was due to using a different endocrine partner. Fulvestrant was the most common endocrine partner used in combination since this was a non-randomized retrospective analysis. But to try and understand this benefit more, there are two ongoing trials, the MAINTAIN trial uh, and the Palmyra trial. Both are relatively small trials looking to see whether or not you could continue a CDK4-6 inhibitor after progression on an aromatase inhibitor and CDK4-6 inhibitor. Um, and the Palmyra trial is looking at uh, fulvestrant as the endocrine partner uh, with progression, so or letrozole. So these are very important studies, and we're looking forward to seeing data in the next year or two. Now, uh, there is, of course, another targeted agent, uh, class of targeted agents that we can use for patients who progressed, had progressive disease after receiving a CDK4-6 inhibitor and an aromatase inhibitor or fulvestrant. PI3 kinase mutations uh, and activation of this pathway uh, due to PIK3CA mutations contribute to endocrine resistance. And this is the most frequently mutated gene in breast cancer, occurring in about 40% of patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative advanced breast cancer. We also know from a number of data, including analysis from Sa the SAFIR trials, that the presence of a PIK3CA mutation is a negative prognostic factor in patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer, although this is likely not true in the early stage setting. So this is data from Solar One, where the primary endpoint uh, of adding alpelisib or placebo to fulvestrin was progression-free survival. This looks at the PIK3CA mutant cohort and shows the benefit in progression-free survival with almost a doubling from 5.7 to 11 months. And this was true whether the PIK3CA mutation was detected in tumor tissue, either archival or from a metastatic source, 
or from a tissue from plasma as a cell-free DNA. And this shows you the uh, benefit in progression-free survival in this lower curve in patients whose PIK3CA mutation was determined from plasma compared to those uh, with tissue. There was no benefit in patients who did not have a mutation in PIK3CA. Only 6% of patients enrolled in Solar One had prior exposure to a CDK4-6 inhibitor because of the timing of this trial. We just saw at ESMO last year, now published in the Annals of Oncology, the overall survival data from Solar One. Although the median overall survival was prolonged by 7.9 months for patients receiving alpelacib and fulvestrant, the final overall survival in the PIK3CA mutant cohort did not cross the pre-specified efficacy boundary that required a p-value of uh, less than or equal to 0.0161. Here you can see the p-value was 0.15, although there is this numeric difference. Now, we also looked at patients who had visceral metastases and relative endocrine resistance to try and understand that benefit. And here you really see a striking numerical difference from 22.8 to 37.2 months in patients receiving alpelacib, indicating, as we've seen before, that there is significant benefit from adding alpelacib to fulvestrant in patients who have the worst prognosis disease, those with visceral uh, metastases. The hazard ratio here is 0.68, and the confidence interval just reaches one because of the numbers of patients enrolled here, which was relatively small. Now, we've also been interested in understanding and managing the adverse events with alpelacib because this can actually be a significant factor in patients being able to receive therapy. We know the most common grade three or greater adverse events are hyperglycemia, rash, and diarrhea. Generally, the rash and hyperglycemia occur within the first few weeks of treatment, and diarrhea occurs over time. So diarrhea can be actually a late toxicity for patients who are receiving alpelacib. And the numbers, uh, median time to onset and median time to improvement are shown here. Recognition, screening, and prophylaxis can make an a significant difference in the tolerability uh, for alpelacib for our patients with PIK3CA mutations. And this is important because as you can see here, patients who had an alpelacib dose of at least 250 milligrams or greater seem to have a better PFS in this analysis of PFS by median dose intensity and compared to the patients who received a lower dose, although this still was numerically longer than those on placebo. Because of the issue with having very few patients exposed to prior CDK4-6 inhibitors, we performed a phase two open label three cohort non-comparative trial called by leave. We presented cohort A at ASCO in 2020 and cohort B at San Antonio. I'll present these data at a Novartis satellite a little bit later today. Cohort C, which are patients who've uh, progressed after chemotherapy, has completed accrual, and we should see the results sometime later this year. Now, we also, of course, have everolimus for our patients who don't have PIK3CA mutations or who cannot tolerate uh, alpelacib. And as you can see here, you can combine everolimus either with fulvestrant or tamoxifen, as well as exemestane in Bolera 2, and expect to see relatively similar improvements in progression-free survival. There are also a new AKT inhibitors, capivacertib and apatacertib, that are being tested in combination with endocrine therapy based on encouraging data from a phase two a trial called the FACTION study. There's the phase three Capitello 291 trial in combination with fulvestrant and the Opportunity 150 trial looking at apatacertib with both palbociclib and fulvestrant. There are oral selective estrogen receptor down regulators and selective estrogen receptor covalent antagonists that are in clinical trials. And I've listed some of them here. The first phase three trial that we expect to see reported is the Elacitrant trial, uh, and uh, we hope to see that data sometime later this year. New directions also include combinations with immunotherapy, although we have to be careful about enhanced toxicity as we showed when we combined a bemaciclib, pembrolizumab, and an aromatase inhibitor in data we presented at AACR in 2020 and in ASCO in 2020. The PACE trial is evaluating a triplet with a 
immuno-oncology agents, avelumab, in combination with palbociclib and fulvestrant in patients who progressed on an AI and a CDK4-6 inhibitor and have received up to one prior chemotherapy. And then one arm uh, continues the CDK4-6 inhibitor without the IO agent, and then one arm receives fulvestrant alone in 220 patients. There's also the PATINA trial looking at palbociclib maintenance with an aromatase inhibitor, trastuzumab and pertuzumab after a Cleopatra-like induction in HER2-positive disease. So how do we sequence endocrine therapy to solve the puzzle? Targeted agents clearly improve outcome for patients with metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer. CDK4-6 inhibitors and PI3 kinase inhibitors are effective in patients with both visceral and bone dominant disease. And the, PIC3, the PI3 kinase inhibitor alpelosib is specifically effective in patients who have tumor associated PIK3CA mutations, either in cell free DNA or tumor tissue. Chemotherapy should be sequenced after all available endocrine therapy options, except in the case of immediately life-threatening disease, as it clearly reduces the benefit that patients receive from subsequent endocrine therapy, generating additional pathways for resistance. Sequencing depends on prior treatment in the early stage setting, disease-free interval, biologic markers like PIK3CA mutations, and acquired resistance under the pressure of treatment does not appear to impact effectiveness of subsequent therapy when these are sequential endocrine therapy treatments. Progression-free survival too has been looked at in a number of these trials, and patients still have a longer PFS, even if they received the targeted agent in a prior line of treatment. This, of course, remarkable progress leads to changing paradigms, and we can base this on endocrine sensitivity. However, uh, these patients all should receive a CDK4-6 inhibitor in the first line setting. At the moment, we really haven't isolated a group of patients who won't benefit from a CDK4-6 inhibitor. In the second line setting, our treatment decisions depend on whether or not a patient's tumor has a PIK3CA mutation and tolerance for alpelosib, as well as underlying glucose intolerance and ability to control hyperglycemia. With that, I'll thank you very much for your attention and look forward to further discussion during this meeting.